Okay. Hi, I'm Dana Robinson. I'm from the HDF group, and I will be uh, talking about some changes coming to HDF 5.1.13.0, mostly VFD and bowl stuff, but a few other things as well. And then at the end, my uh, colleague, Joe Lee, will take over and talk a little bit about the uh, async and cache bowl connectors. All right, so uh, we'll go over HDF 5.1.13.0, a couple of changes that are coming just broadly. Uh, then we'll talk about some changes we're making to the VFD layer, mostly about plugins. Um, talk about some changes coming to the VOL, the virtual object layer, and we'll talk about some template VOL connectors that we have if you're creating your own VOL connector. And then we'll talk a little bit about the async and cache VOLs. So HDF 5.1.13.0 is, we're calling an unstable version. Um, it means that the APIs are subject to change. So the file format may change. There's no binary compatibility guarantees. Uh, doesn't mean buggy. It just means that it's subject to change as we develop things. Um, it's going to be late 2021, we think. And if you notice anything that you think should be improved while you're working on a, a VFD or a vol connector or with any of the new APIs, uh, please send us feedback so that we can improve things. There's still time. This is an unstable release. Um, this is the default develop branch in uh, HDF5, the HDF5 repository on GitHub. There will not be an HDF5.113 branch like we have HDF5.110 and 112. We just do all releases. They split off of the develop branch at particular points. They're full releases though. We, we do do a release of these things. Um, and then HDF5.114.0, which would be the stable version where we actually do care about binary compatibility in the file format. Uh, we're targeting that for late 2022. Uh, HDF 5.1.13.0 assumes a lot of modern things. We removed a lot of cruft that um, dated back to 1997 when we first started coding. Um, so we assume CN89, C++11, if you're building the wrappers, C++ wrappers, um, targets modern POSIX compatibility. It does require Visual Studio 2015 on Windows to the C99 needs. Um, and uh, there's just, there's fewer checks for obsolete things. We used to check for missing C99 functionality. A lot of stuff is, is gone. So if you are building on a platform and it doesn't work, please let us know so that we can um, look into the build files and see how to, how to work around that. Another thing that's important to know for people who are creating VOL and VFD plugins it, and also filter plugins is that we're turning off the memory sanity checks by default when we release the library. So we have these things, we add heap canaries to things, and that causes problems when people reallocate memory cause the library to be sad. So we've turned that off by default. So that should, if you've seen that problem mentioned elsewhere, that will not be a problem anymore in any of our releases. Um, we're also, one of the things we've added to HDF 5.1.13 is there's a lot of asynchronous HDF 5 functionality. Um, this does require an async capable vol connector. Um, it's not, there's no native, functionality for this, and uh, but but we're not going to talk about async very much in this, aside from looking at the, the connector. So it's a big topic. So the, the virtual file drivers, just to remind ourselves, are these, um, or can you guys see the, um, the my, my cursor here? Yes. That worked. Okay, great. Um, so the, the virtual file drivers are basically different ways of mapping um, like offset length things that are sent and file operations to um, to, to different media, right? We have like the sec2 POSIX driver, that's the default one. There's MPIO, which is the one that we use for parallel HDF5. We have one that can map um, native uh, vol connector things to the, to the Amazon S3 in a read-only way. Um, so, so there's a way of, of creating these things, but we, we never made this um, plugins. And so that's what we're adding now. Um, this allows you to um, connect the native HDF5 format to a wider variety of data sources in an easier way, whenever it leverages the strengths of the filter plugin scheme that's been pretty successful for HDF5. Um, it, it's more convenient for users because um, you can just use a, just drop a plugin into a directory. Um, and it, it brings more contributions into the HDF5 ecosystem and just makes HDF5 more adaptable to a, a changing data landscape. Uh, documentation for this exists. We have a VFG plugin RFC that talks about all the things that went into this, this particular feature. Um, there's a support portal page for dynamic plugins of all types. And there's a support portal page for registered plugins. And we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Right now, there's no VFD page for registered um, VFDs because we don't have any yet, but that will go up soon after we release the feature. So VFDs as dynamically loaded plugins works exactly like the existing filter and full plugins. So all the H5PL 
Um, API calls work just like they do any, elsewhere. Uh, same default paths, uh, we use them for all plugins. Um, this is one on the screen here for, for POSIX and this one for, for Windows, but you can change this if you want. There's an HDF5 plugin path environment variable. You can also modify these things with the H5PL API calls. And one thing to know about the VFD plugins is that they are loaded when you call H5P set driver API calls. And we'll look at those in just a second. Or when you have set the HDF5 driver environment variable, which we'll again discuss in a later slide. And so if you've set that and then you create a FAPL, then it's going to inspect that environment variable and, and try to dynamically load your plugin at that point. Um, we have two environment variables. We have HDF5 driver and HDF5 driver config. And we'll talk about the configuration strings in just a minute. Um, but this allows you to specify um, uh, a VFD that will be used in place of the default VFD. Um, we used to use this in testing, if you, you may have seen this before in some of our documentation, but now this, this works about the entire library. Um, and again, this, this replaces the default VFD on the FAPL at creation time. So when you go to do H5P create, it's gonna inspect this variable and, um, and, and create it appropriately. So some VFDs require a way to pass arbitrary configuration data to them. You know, maybe some, some cloud, um, configuration stuff or some database configuration stuff or whatever you might need. And the way that we have set this up is that you can do this by passing a string that will be interpreted by the VFD. We, we impose no structure on this string, so you can use whatever you want, JSON, YAML, XML, whatever you want to do. Um, and they're using these H5P set calls, which we'll look at in just a sec. And also in the command line tools, you can pass these on the command line. And we'll talk about that in a minute too. And all, the VFD authors, if you're creating your own VFD, you can use the H5P get driver config string on the passed in FAPL to get that string and then do whatever you need to do with it, whatever processing makes sense for your, for your VFD. Um, we've added um, a, val a value field to the H5FD class struct. And this is a unique identifier for the VFD plugin. It's the same scheme that we use in the filters and in the Vol library. In the, vol, in the virtual object layer plugins. We don't call it an ID because that people confuse that with the HIDT IDs that we use in the library, the library managed IDs. But it's, it's just typed off to an integer. It's just a, a value that we can use when we're looking around and trying to dynamically find your, your plugin to make sure that we load the, the right thing because names are a little less robust than that. People might call two different plugins a log plugin. Um, that uses the same kind of range scheme that we've used in the filter plugins and in the vol plugins. There's a, a range that's just for THG. There's a range that will never be used by anybody. And that's for testing. That's the 256 to 511 range. And then the for new VFD plugins, like if, you, if you've created one and you want us to put it on our web page, um, we we give you an ID, and you can get one of those by emailing the help desk. Just help at hdfgroup.org, and we assign you a number. So some new API calls to manage this. There's the set driver by name and the set driver by value. The exact same call, they just differ by whether you're gonna look for the plugin by its name or by its value. Um, and then there's also this, this get driver config string, which is mostly of, for use by um, plugin authors, but you could also, if you've got something set up, you can get that config string back out and then you can use it to create more fab in the exact same way. Um, there's some other new API calls to tell if, uh, if a, if a VFD is registered or not by name or by value. And we have tool support. This is the exact same way that we handle it with the virtual object layer plugins. Um, when you call H5LS or H5Dump, you can pass VFD value or VFD name to specify the name or the value of the plugin we should go look for. And then VFD info is the configuration string that we pass to the VFD. And it's the exact same way that you specify, specify a bowl connector in 112, only it's VFD info instead of bowl info and so on. So when you're, if you're going to create your own VFD plugins, uh, it's like all other plugins, you have to implement H5PL get plugin type and H5PL get plugin info, which are, there's a header file for this H5PL extern.h in the library. We have two example VFDs. We have uh, the standard IO VFD and the multi VFD have been in the library for a very long time. And standard IO is a single file of VFD and the multi VFD is a multi file of VFD. And those are written in standard C. They use no internal HDF5 API calls or any of our platform independence layer or anything like that. So you can copy those and use those as templates 
for your own VFDs. Just clear out all the stuff that's inside them and add your rename them and then add, add your own functionality. We don't have a template project repository at this time, but you could use the build files in the template vol connector, which we'll talk about a little bit later as a start. One of the things that people often have trouble with is getting um, all the build stuff correct to make a, something that's discoverable by the HDF5 library to get all the linkage set up or whatever. And so that the template bowl has all that set up. So it makes it a little easier. Oops, did I do that right? Yeah, all right. Um, and the we've added a, a new callback to the, 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 the VFD class struct. Uh, it's the CTL callback and that allows arbitrary operations by the VFD. So if your VFD needs to do something that isn't handled by the callbacks that exist in that class structure, you can use this as kind of a kitchen sink to put whatever you want in there. Um, and this is what the, the signature looks like. I'm not gonna talk about this too much. We're gonna have a developer's guide for this and that'll explain it in, in more detail. But essentially you just, you can give it an operation code and there's an input and output buffer. And so you can kind of use this for arbitrary things. We're, we're using this internally to do the MPI VFD things. We're, we've moved them from being their own thing to using this control callback. Um, as far as testing goes, the, the HDF5 test suite is being modified to separate library specific, um, li library VFD specific VFD tests from arbitrary VFD tests. There's a lot of tests where we check to see if things exist at certain offsets. We assume a lot of things that are not necessarily going to be true for all VFDs. And so we've separated those out. So there's a a, a subset of the test suite that should work for arbitrary drivers. That's a large subset. It's not like a small subset. It tests quite a few things. And so you can just set HDF5 driver and HDF5 driver config and then run make check or C test and it'll try your, your VFD out with, um, with, with everything as long as it's in the right plugin path. All right, let me take a sip of water here. All right, so the virtual object layer changes. Um, so again, to remind ourselves that the bowl layer sits right underneath the HDF5 API. So anything that touches storage um, has now been abstracted into this virtual object layer where we dispatch to appropriate calls. So if you call H5F create, then we dispatch to um, a, a create callback. And so the library comes with just the native bowl connector and we also have a password one that we'll talk about in a little bit. But there's a bunch of external ones that are being constructed. One of them is the RESTful. It's a bunch of ECP voles, the async vol, cache vol. Uh, there are many in, under construction right now. So a, as we've been working with the vol, the vol was released in, in an early form in HDF5 1.12, but it's been evolving as we gain experience with it. And so there's been, there's been new demands from ECP connectors. Um, people have really been making heavy and complete use of the API. And so we, we've learned some things. We've needed to change some things from our initial ideas about how some things would work. Um, the programming model is still fundamentally the same. There's some changes for the optional operations. Um, async has changed quite a bit. Um, and most of what we're, we're found, what I'm just describe are for connector authors, not for people who are just consuming a vol connector. Because the, the, one of the goals of the virtual object layer is to have your code work with a minimum amount of changes. So, so everything I'm talking about here is really just for people who are creating their own um, their own vol connectors. So one thing to know is that the HDF5 112 vol API is deprecated at this point. Um, so you should be targeting 113.0. There, there are a lot of important changes to the vol API that we made to make the ECP connectors work properly. And I, we can't bring those to the 112 development branch due to binary compatibility issues. We, we try to pay a lot of attention to that and there's just no way of versioning that in a, in a reasonable way. So um, everything should really target 113, which will become 114 now. Um, the, the current version of the, of, of the API is version two. Um, we also have added uh, a connector version here, this unsigned con version. So you can version your own connector. We don't, we don't really monitor this. This is for you to check. Um, we've changed some of the, the operations in the specific and get callbacks. And I have a summary of this that kind of describes what it is. It's not, not great. Um, there's a few that you should pay attention to. We've got rid of the, um, the, the H5A delete by index um, call is handled separately now. 
mount operations move from files to groups, which makes sense because you can mount things anywhere um, in any group. Uh, the blob get size specific callback moved to the data type get callback. And uh, 112 doesn't have, didn't really have async. So the initial guesses at the request operations changed. It also changed from version one. So if you had something that targeted um, version one of the API, which was never formally released. This, um, go back here to this, H5VL version zero is 112.0. H5VL version one was develop 113 earlier. Now we're currently on version two. Um, so one of the other changes that we've made is that um, there's no more VA list arguments. So anybody who wrote a vol connector now has to update this, but it's pretty straightforward. It's not really difficult to do. We just be, we used to pass in an enum value here for the specific type. And in here, you would have your, your, your arguments that you would pass in. And now what we do is we, we pass in a struct that encompasses all of this. And this, this is, goes all the way from the callback up to the, the kind of like the vol developer API calls that you would use as a vol developer, like H5VL data set get. They're in the public API, but they're not for normal consumption. So uh, just to better show this, th these are the enums that we used to use, like here's a file flush, reopen, mount, unmount. And now what that is, what we do is we just be passing a pointer to the struct that includes the operation, but also includes a giant union of all the different parameter sets that you might need. Um, we also have this new get um, capabilities flags callback. Um, it's part of the introspect class. The capabilities flags that we have are listed in h5vl connector.h. And this was added because stacked vol connectors can't simply return their own capabilities flags, which is what we used to do. You may have to inspect the vols underneath you and see what they can do. And this is the signature of the, the callback. Uh, we also have this new H5 VL query optional change that we've gone from returning a simple Boolean that says, this, is this op optional operation supported or not, to a flag set that gives us a better sense of the operation's behavior. And so it's a, it's a bit set that looks like this, got supported, whether it reads or writes data, whether it queries or modifies metadata, whether it's collective, whether there's um, no async, and whether it touches multiple objects. And this can kind of help full connector authors who are making complex connectors to, to guess how to deal with these things. So um, optional operations also have to be registered using this H5VL register opt operation call. Um, the library will assign an integer operation value that we passed via the, um, the H5VL optional RST when you, when you handle that inside your connector. And um, this is right here, this is out parameter here. And this is to avoid operation clash across vol connectors. Because before we just let people set integers, but if you're doing a pass-through connector, how do you know that it belongs to you or some other connector? And so this allows you to register these things. The library will hand you a unique identifier that you can then save. So this is, this is more complicated. Um, we're, we're gonna document this. We're updating the connector author's guide in the vol documentation that will explain exactly how to do this. And if you want to look to see how this can be done, you can look at the cache vol connector, the async vol connector, both of which um, show you how you should be handling this. Um, we've also, we've updated the, the vol connector for asynchronous operations. Those require a suitable vol connector. I said there's no native HDF5 async functionality. Uh, there'll be a presentation at HUG um, that, that talks more about async. Um, so as far as vol templates go, uh, we've created a template vol connector that you can use to get started. There's no functionality in it. It's just an empty vol structure. But the important thing is that it includes both auto tools and CMake build files. So you can build it right away and have a, a, a plugin that loads but does absolutely nothing. And you can just fill in your own callbacks and then you can pretty easily build a, a vol connector from there. Because we noticed that a lot of people were having trouble just getting started, just making something that was a plugin. So this kind of solves that problem. And it's it's on GitHub, it's in our under our organization. Uh, the pass-through vol connector is a, essentially a template for constructing pass-through vol connectors and lets us make sure that we're doing the right thing with pass-through vol connectors. Um, it simply forwards the calls to another vol connector. Inside the library, we just use it to forward to our own native vol connector. 
Um, but you could clone this. You could add anything sophisticated that you wanted to do from it. It uses standard C, um, no internal HDF5 API calls, just like we do with our demo VFD uh, drivers. So it's kind of designed for other people to kind of pick that up and modify it. Um, it's located in the HDF5 source direct repository. It's then the source directory. It's H5VL passed through CNH. Um, so you can just copy that into the template vol connector and then go make that work for you. Uh, there's vol documentation. We have a vol user's guide and vol connector author's guide. Um, there, there will be an updated connector author's guide that will have a section on migrating version zero and one connectors explicitly, particularly um, how to deal with the, the new optional operations, which is much more complicated. Um, and then there's the Vol API reference manual, which is um, on our portal, but we're moving it to Doxygen. So um, there's a link to that as well. All right. And then so uh, next, I will turn this over to uh, my colleague, Jolie, who will talk about the asynchronous Vol and the cache Vol. Hi, my name is Jolie, and I'm a software developer at the HF Group. I'll give you a brief demo for HF5 Vol that Dana described. For demo, there are two valves that I want to show today. One is a synchronous ball, and the other is a cache ball. They are chosen because they are independently developed and maintained by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, LBNL, not by our group. That means anyone can develop uh, HF5 ball to access any data in any storage using HT5 APIs and their applications. Next. Building and testing a sync cache vault is quite complex because it has many dependencies. At the top, you will see vault tests. Although we focus on a sync and cache vaults now, there are four other balls, and we expect HF5 ball community will grow significantly as data formats and storage mechanisms become more heterogeneous. To test all current and future balls effectively, the HF group created a test suite called the ball test. We encourage every ball developer to test the new ball using all tests that we provide. You will later see a demo whether the current cache ball can pass our ball test. Cache ball requires a synchronous ball underneath, and a synchronous ball requires both Argo balls and HDF5. The HDF5 at the bottom must be 1.13 or later, and that's what Dana explained. Next slide. As you saw from the previous slide, building and testing cache ball is quite complex due to many dependencies. However, thanks to SPAC, it is quite easy to install and test all the dependencies. Thus, we provide a simple three-liner SPAC installation and test script that is available from GitHub now. And Spec is very efficient and useful for both testing. For each dependency, it is possible to try a different GitHub repository. Next slide, please. The no, previous one. Yeah. Before I show the real demo, I'd like to admit that I'm just providing the spec packages for both and do not know how a sync cache balls work underneath. Therefore, if you have any question about the technical details of a sync cache balls, LBNL team will explain them fully during the upcoming HDF5 user group meeting in October. So please attend them. Next slide. Now I'll share my screen.
So this is the script that I ran this morning at 8.14 a.m. And you clone my repository, spell repository, then change to the bin directory and run this script called the passport.sh. Then you will in install all the packages dependent on HFI, Argobots, And this will install HFI from the LBNL. This is the initial development work. Then install all async package, then ball cache. And at the end, you will install ball tests and run the test. And you will see at the end, test result will be shown like this. So there are two failures. One is real failure. The other one is timeout in parallel test. Since we are running spec, it's easy to change individual package underneath dependency. The first one I ran with the uh, LBNS HFI. Now we switch the dependency of HFI to the, our development 1.13 version. Then I can run the script again and spec will pick it up automatically, what's changing. So everything is same. And now they reveal the HFI using the HF groups development branch. Then reinstall a sync ball, cache ball, and test them again. Now you will see one more test failures compared to the LBNS HF5. And that's how it, you can test HFI balls easily with the spec. Now I'll stop sharing my screen and go back to the slides. Then I can you show the slide again? Next slide. So we'll continue working on identifying the root cause of test failures, as you saw in the demo. Then we'll keep pushing our current development work to the upstream spec repository. Our group has own spec repository, and it will be used first for peer review among HF developers. Then we'll be we'll publish our work to the official spec eventually for the community review. Next slide, please. And that's it for my demo. And thank you. That's what we have. Are there any questions? And people can feel free to unmute to ask questions or use the chat. Um, thank you, Joe and Dana, for plugging the HDF5 user group meeting coming up. I also put the link in the chat to just go ahead and register. Um, ultimately, if we don't get any questions here after we wrap, I'll process the video and post it in the forum and email it um, and hopefully get the notes from Dana and post those as well. Yeah, I highly recommend attending the, the hug meeting. It looks like it's going to be really good. A lot of good talks there. Sorry, is there a link for the agenda of the hug meeting? Um, oh, yeah. I will finalize the agenda. So the speakers have the agenda right now just to make sure everyone's okay with their schedule. But I'll finalize that over the weekend and send out an email 
um, right now, if you go to the link on the screen, you can see a list of presentations, but just not, we'll get the schedule next week. All right, thank you. Uh, one question, uh, can, uh, today we, we are seeing a lot of uh, URL for the repository and is it possible that we can have a list of them so we can uh, easy to to get a copy of them? Yeah, the links are real links in this presentation. I assume this will be on the web. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know a little bit more about why I might choose to write a vol uh, provider or a VFD plugin. Well, the, this is, if this you're, is yeah, if, if you have, um, if you're trying to map the HDF5 API to some arbitrary storage medium, then you would probably want to, or, or to do something kind of on every um, connector that comes in, uh, every every file oriented thing that comes in, like some kind of like API level logging or something like that, then you probably want a vol connector um, because then you can kind of do anything you want. Like if you were to say you want to map the HDF5 API to a relational database or to MongoDB or something like that, um, or to some version of cloud storage in some arbitrary way, then yeah, you'd want to create a, a, a vol connector. A VFD connector is where you're really working at the native file format and you want to just kind of translate how the um, the the offsets and lengths get scribbled out right like if say like one of the first things we're working on is a GPU VFD so if you want to say you know deal with with GPUs and then push stuff into GPU memory then that's that's kind of a thing that you can do with with the, at the VFD level if you want to split it off and 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 put metadata in one spot. We have like the split VFD. If you want to do something similar like that, it's it's really it's a it's a lower level operation that is that uses the HDF5 library, things like the metadata cache and, and the other features that we have. Things that are not present at the bowl layer. I may be able to add to that slightly if desired. Mm -hmm. Sure. What's going on with the VFD is it's presenting the underlying storage just as a vector of bytes to the HDF5 library in the sense of the native connector. Uh, if you can use it, it's probably a good idea because it's a lot easier than creating a uh, vault connector. Uh, but that is in essence what you have to do with the VFD. Uh, whether you are distributing that file across, uh, logical file across subfiles, across objects in the object store, all of that can be done at the VFD layer, but you're still dealing with the logical HDF5 file. The vol layer lets you do whatever. You can store your data however you like. I hope that's useful. Thanks, that's good. Yeah, the, the VFD, I guess, I, essentially abstracts native HDF5 storage, the vol connector abstracts everything under the API entirely. Uh, one question about uh, the, the vol. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to focus on develop a new vol that is uh, uh, for parallel processing, for parallel IO, mm -hmm. is there any general uh, uh, suggestion for how we should spatially uh, taking care of the implementation. Like uh, uh, the cache ball and asynchronous ball, I believe that uh, that is, should be available for both uh, sequential IO and parallel IO, but uh, in particular, if you want to make use of them in a new ball development, then is there any uh, general, general suggestion that we should be spatially about uh, their, the data consistency or uh, synchro, uh, synchronization of the uh, issue or implementation? I personally don't have any specific advice like that. There are people here who have created parallel aware vol connectors. I don't know if they have any specific advice. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, maybe one thing I can mention is that uh, uh, one thing you have maybe to take uh, pay attention to is to uh, if you want your vault, for example, to to do collective metadata rights or independence. Um, so what that means is creating your groups data sets uh, independently or collectively. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that you may have to take care to pay more attention to when you're creating a vault. I mean, the vault gives you the ability to uh, actually have independent uh, uh, metadata. Uh, your, uh, so creating your groups data sets independently, whereas uh, a VFD, for example, wouldn't be able to. But so yeah, that's the kind of things you have to to eventually pay attention to. Uh, I mean, we have some examples for that uh, in the Deus world, for example. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, if I may add a uh, bit of things. So uh, there is uh, this terminal walls where you maintain how the data is being stored and Nate, going through uh, our pass through walls which are going through the native wall eventually and then maintaining the hdf by five format still so what we noticed is when you use uh, uh, in parallel uh, we had to make sure that um, ordering and everything is proper when you're going back to the pass through and native wall um, but if it is more of a terminal wall, then you manage how, how you're doing the parallel coordination among the processes. So that's what we noticed uh, with, with our experience. Any other questions? So, okay, yeah, maybe. Uh, is there a page where you where you're collecting all the walls, or because each wall can be developed by uh, uh, by some developer, and when they register, are you maintaining a link to all those wall connectors somewhere? I would have to go look at the web page to see exactly what's on there, but I think we usually do. Okay. Just like we do for the filters, you can go there and I think we have links to all the source. Okay. I think I have a link I'm going to put in a chat. Okay. But we do that, right, Lori? Get on the. Yeah, there was a forum post about that. And so on the support portal, there's a list. So yeah, that's in the chat now. If anyone needs that or wants to verify, I put in the right thing. Any other questions? There is a question in the chat. That I don't know why there is no Ubuntu dot dev package for HDFU. So in general, for unanswered questions, you can email help at hdfgroup.org and uh, we'll get that routed to the right person. So just for a little background, I noticed it's supported under Mac, Windows, and CentOS or Red Hat. And yet nowadays with containerization and all that, for example, we're doing all of our work in Ubuntu-based containers. And so, and the way that most people seem to address this by taking the RPM and using Alien 
does not lead to a very good installation on Ubuntu. Mm. And so, I mean, so we have a world where TensorFlow is better supported on Ubuntu than Red Hat, but HDF5 is, you know, the inverse. It just seemed a little bit odd. You can also hassle us on the forum. That's a good place to, to post that. And then people will answer. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But I'll bring this up. I have morning meetings with the people who are in charge of this. So I will ask. I'm an Ubuntu user myself. I seem to recall the answer might be that creating .deb packages was more work than creating RPMs, but I'm not 100% for sure. Anything else? Okay. Uh, for, I know this uh, uh, today's meeting is about one point thirteen point zero or some new uh, new features. Is there any uh, uh, new features related to parallel I/O? Mm, I don't think so. In in general, stuff that doesn't break binary compatibility, we try to push down into 112 releases and even 110. So um, th this was mostly about things that are difficult or impossible to bring to, to 112, like the vol changes we can't bring. But, but most things that we had a new feature, um, a lot of times it goes to 112 as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. Thanks for coming.